Chapter 31 His first level point zero spell, 2, you are listening at novel full.audio. Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.B.O. Studio Link never thought that for someone who was a poor student on earth, he would actually be able to sit quietly and focus his attention on reading a dry and technical textbook on magic and spells. In fact, he had been engrossed in the reading for almost a whole day. When he started, he had to force himself to focus. It was almost torturous at first, his eyelids were heavy from the endless numerical mana formulas and the sea of magic runes that looked like nothing he'd ever seen before. But as his focus gradually settled into the subject of the book, he became more and more interested in the contents, and by the end of it, he was completely enthralled. The experience of reading the magic textbooks now was completely different from what he experienced last night while reading Theory of Mana Turbulence in Celine's room. Yesterday, he was only roughly scanning the book's pages, he wasn't paying close attention at all, and he didn't apply himself to the knowledge. But this time, Link put in all his efforts into the book. He flipped through each page slowly, sometimes he even stopped between pages to carefully think about what he had just read. According to the book, spells were divided into six major types. Elemental spells, secret spells, conjuring spells, summoning spells, enchanting spells, and alchemy spells. For spells of level 0.3 and below, the differences between these various types of spells weren't significant. A magician could develop their skills in all types of spells. But as the magician reached level 0.3 and above, they would need to specialize and decide which type of spells to focus on. A magician could normally only develop and advance their skills in only one spell type. To be an expert in more than one type of spell after level. 4 was fundamentally impossible, and very rarely were there any exceptions. The book, Foundation Structure of Spells, listed Fireball and Earth Spike as examples of elemental spells, and Lesser Invisibility as a conjuring spell. As for secret spells and summoning spells, there were no examples given because these two branches were extremely obscure subjects. Very rarely could someone learn about them through textbooks alone. The only way to learn about them was to study directly with a tutor. As he finished reading about the magic structure of Fireball, Link took out his new moon wand and tried to cast the spell. The spell casting process consisted of three steps. First was to attract mana, the second was to build the spell structure, and the third was to release the spell. The most critical phase was building the spell structure. The success of any spell casting process depended on this very step. Link focused all his attention and followed each point instructed in the book. Two seconds later, the tip of the new moon wand lit up, and a tiny point of light appeared in thin air near the tip of the wand. This was the fireball spell's prototype. The light point was about the size of a grain of rice, it was maintained for about a second, and then with a puff, the light disappeared into thin air. If the building of the spell structure failed, then the spell casting would abruptly come to an end. This can be quite difficult. Link pursed his lips. He realized that this method of learning was completely different from the way he learned the spells he obtained with his Omni points. Right now, mana was as wild and mischievous as a child. When he wanted it to go left, it would insist on going right. When he wanted it to stabilize, it would become agitated. It was almost impossible to keep it under his control. Link tried again. Three seconds later, there was another puff, and a pebble dot sized light orb once again appeared, then rapidly disappeared, another failed attempt at fireball. Link felt a hot rush of air hit his face. He was lucky that he was only testing out a level point zero spell. Had it been the level point four spell, Flame Blast, and he had messed up in the middle of the spell casting process, he would have been burnt to a crisp. Magic was considered to be the biggest force in this world. But it was also a double dot edged sword. The more powerful the magician, the more cautious they had to be at spell casting. This was a saying by a famous master magician, whom which Link now deeply agreed with. If one couldn't stand the collapse of a level 0.4 spell, then a legendary spell might even kill them. 
In truth, magicians who wish to study high dot level spells must make use of different types of tools to aid them. The most important among these tools was a fully functioning mage tower. A mage tower could help a magician by monitoring and controlling the area surrounding the tower, and the equipment inside the tower could also be used to protect them while they were experimenting with new spells. However, the downside of these towers was the cost to build them. A normal mage tower required a huge amount of magic and anti-magic materials, costing about 10,000 gold coins to build, an unbelievably high price. Strength always came at a cost. Magic was like an expensive hobby that burned up money at the speed that was simply unbelievable to the average man. Of course, Link had not thought of Mage Towers yet at this moment. Fireball was nothing but a level point zero spell, he could boldly experiment with it without worrying about his safety. The third, fourth, and fifth time casting the spell were all failures. Then on the sixth attempt, after about five seconds, a white marble dot-sized glass orb finally appeared at the end of the wand's tip. Link now directly observed and experienced the whole process of how a spell came to be from scratch. Mana flows in, and the spell structure was constructed, and the fire element was drawn in, building a stable structure. What a beautiful process! He felt a warm rush of air from the small fireball in front of him and Link's heart was filled with pride at his small achievement. Fireball was the very first spell that he had truly learned. But then Link laughed at himself. This is just a level point zero spell, and I still needed five seconds to cast it. Besides, my fireball is only good for lighting a match. In the game, he could release level point zero spells in 0.1 seconds. Only with that speed could they be of any use in battle. However, Link had faith that he would get better in time with more practice. Link also had no reason to worry that he would use up all of the mana in his body while practicing. He made sure to reabsorb the mana used for the spell, and so when the fireball slowly disappeared, the lost energy re-entered Link's body. Then, Link let some more mana flow into the wand, then built the spell structure again. This time, after four seconds, the fireball was completed. Link was beginning to get the hang of it, and he incessantly practiced again and again. He was so fully immersed that he was unaware of the flow of time. He cast the spell again and again, not realizing when the spellcasting using his own efforts and the spellcasting obtained from Omni points melded together and became indistinguishable. Fwoosh! A stable fireball appeared at the tip of his wand, and then, puff, the fireball disappeared, and the mana was reabsorbed. All of this happened quickly, just as one would switch lights on and off. Without knowing it, Link's spellcasting had sped up to less than 0.1 seconds. Link felt that in just one second he could release at least 20 fireballs. He was in an unusual state right now, where he still received aids and boosts from the gaming system, but he could also feel and understand each step in the process of spellcasting and the underlying structure of the spells. Did you boost my spellcasting? Link asked the gaming system. It would be impossible for him to advance so quickly if it was only just his efforts. The gaming system replied. Of course. Repeated practice of a single move would only consume a player's energy, and wouldn't help with the player's understanding towards magic. When the player has developed their understanding of the spell's foundation, the system will boost the player's spellcasting to speed up their overall spellcasting speed. Then how fast can I release each level point zero spell exactly? 0.0512 seconds. That's the limit for fire element spells. You can't get any faster than that. Spellcasting time for elemental spells was divided into two parts. First, was the mana structure construction time. This depended on the mental speed of the magician, which could surely be improved with practice. Second, was the time for the elements to accumulate and arrange into proper configuration. This speed depended on the concentration of the elements in the surrounding area. To compare between the snowy grounds of the north and the deserts of the south, the latter would accumulate fire elements ten times faster than the former. In the room that Link was staying, 
fire elements needed 0.05 seconds to accumulate, and this was the fastest time limit for the spell. Oh, that means I'm pretty fast then. 0.0512 seconds, that was as fast as lightning. Link was satisfied with this level of progress. The next time he practiced fireballs, he didn't pay too much attention in controlling the stability of the spell structure, instead, he put his efforts into the process of attracting fire elements. After more than 10 minutes, a doubt emerged in Link's mind. There are flaws in this spell structure. Once he'd gotten practice and some experience, Link now started to question things. He now understood the whole spellcasting process, and he could discern some shortcomings in the structure of the fireball spell. He paid thorough attention to the structure of the spell and made further discoveries. This spell's process in drawing on fire elements from its surroundings isn't perfect, and not very efficient. But it is very stable, and the simplest and easiest to develop. But these aren't what I need in my spells, maybe I can modify and improve it. Link was a man of action, once he had an idea he immediately set out to do it. But at this moment, someone knocked on the door. From outside, Eliard called out, Link, it's time to get going now. Link turned around to look out the window. It was only then that he realized that the sky was getting light. Wait, I'm coming, Link responded hurriedly. Putting away his wand, he hastily washed his face and tried to make himself appear more energetic. But, from what he'd seen in the mirror, no matter how he looked at himself, he just looked like an average person. The ailing mana had surely been affecting him. He opened the door and saw Eliard. Link felt even more nervous now. After a good night's rest, Eliard had changed into new clothes. His whole person seemed more vivacious now, as if he were glowing. Those pair of light green eyes of his were clear, yet meaningful as if they were shining themselves. Anyone who saw him would know that he had strong spirits. In magic, there was a spell called aura detection, where one could measure the auras emanating from a target. Link hadn't learned it yet, but he believed that if anyone were to check Eliard using this spell, they would find that he was glowing with a brilliant mana force. Ah, what can you say when he's the number one most talented magician and the number one most handsome man in the game? He really has a dashing appearance that no one can compare to. Link couldn't help but lament. After the two had their breakfasts in the hall, they were on the move. East Cove Academy was 30 miles southeast of River Cove Town, in a coven area. It wasn't that far away since the road was level. They only had to walk for about two hours, then the cove entrance was already in view. At the entrance was a massive stone plaque, and on it, written in huge letters, was the name of the East Cove Higher Magic Academy. There was a crest on top, with a lion's head in the middle, and crossing wands beneath it, signifying magic in service of the Kingdom of Norton. Beside the stone plaque was a small two-dot-story wooden building, and in front of the building was a courtyard where a white dot haired old man clad in a bluish gray magician's robe was sunbathing on a long chair. Just as Link turned to the direction of the old man, a notification flashed up. Vincent Level.2 Normal Magician Status Measures Constant Auras Position East Cove Magic Academy Admission and Qualification Tester At the time Vincent saw Link and Eliard, he swept a glance at them and asked, are both of you trying to enter the academy? Yes, both of them answered respectfully. Vincent raised the wand in his hand and pointed it towards Eliard, then nodded, you may enter, as long as you can pay the tuition fees. He pointed the wand towards Link, then shook his head, you, your innate mana is too low. Unless, if you could prove you have enough knowledge and insight in magic, if not then go back to where you came from. Chapter 32 a Glimmer of Sunlight in a Cold, Cruel World, Part 1, You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator. Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor. Nyo I.B.O. Studio This Gatekeeper certainly calls it like he sees it. Fortunately, Link was prepared for this kind of outcome. His current maximum mana limit was now 24.1, a very low figure, no different from that of an average magician's apprentice. 
it would take a miracle for him to get accepted into this academy. Of course, he still had 105 Omni points left, and he could spend all of it to increase his maximum mana. Even if ailing mana had a 90% effect on him, by exchanging one Omni point with 10 points of maximum mana, he could increase his maximum mana to 129.1 points. That was equivalent to that of a typical level 0.2 magician, and enough for admission into the Magic Academy. But that would be a silly thing to do. Yes, he might possess the power of a level 0.2 magician, but his knowledge would be nowhere near that. And if he did enter the academy this way, he would naturally be assigned to classes for level 0.2 magicians, classes that would be completely incomprehensible to him. What would be the point of that? Admittedly, Link was only here to try his luck. He knew that if he was rejected he would just have to go back to the inn and teach himself the basic foundations of magic, and then he'd try again. He wouldn't feel too bad about being turned away, so he responded to Ilyard's sympathetic stare with a smile, signifying he was fine. Nonetheless, this experience had taught him a valuable lesson. He would never have guessed that one could enter the East Cove Higher Magic Academy with just a thesis. Nothing like that was ever mentioned in the game on Earth. In fact, in the game, once you reached a certain level, you could just pay a certain amount of money and bam, you were now a student of the Higher Magic Academy. How could my friend prove his skill in magic then? Asked Eliard. Vincent snickered as he scrutinized Eliard's appearance from head to toe. He gave the young man's attire the one stud over and said jeeringly, Worry about yourself, boy. The tuition fees of the Eastern Cove High Magic Academy aren't cheap you know. Vincent had seen all walks of life, and this had allowed him to accurately judge a person's situation in life just based on their appearance. With a mere glance, he could clearly see the disparity in quality between these two young men's clothing. This unremarkable young man might have been wearing a plain grey robe, but it was made of fine squirrel fur, the value of which was at least ten times higher than that of the shiny new clothes on the pretty boy's body. By his estimation, he was sure that the ordinary-looking young man must be of the noble class. His companion, on the other hand, was nothing more than a simple commoner. Regarding funds, Eliard had naturally come prepared. Before preparing for magic training, he had thought over and over of various ways he could make money. Fortunately, he had a decent brain between his ears, and that allowed him to find a way to save up 200 gold coins, the exact amount, from what he had heard, needed for the academy's tuition fees. Dot, oh, you mean the 200 gold coins. I've got it right here, Eliard said with a laugh. To the young man's surprise, Vincent shook his head and laughed. He held up two fingers and said, No, no, you've got it all wrong my boy. It isn't 200 gold coins for you, that is the price for a student who came from a noble family. For a commoner, it's 300 gold coins. Unfortunately, though, the academy received too many students this year, so there isn't any space left. If you do enter the academy, you will be an extra member of the student body, and as such, you will be charged for the extra arrangements and extra materials, and these, of course, will cost money. As a commoner you won't be entitled to benefits or discounts, so all in all, the total fees will amount to 2,000 gold coins. Eliard was stunned, and his brows furrowed. It can't possibly be ten times the usual amount. That's ridiculous. How many commoners in this world could fork over 2,000 gold coins? Only the rich merchants of the Northern Free District could ever afford such a ridiculous sum of money. This is nothing more but a barely masked effort to prevent commoners from learning magic. Link, however, knew that the Magic Academy wasn't just trying to screw them over. Money was essential to a magician. What commoners might view as a large sum of money could easily be spent in a heartbeat on a random piece of magical gear. Take this new moon wand in his hand, for example. This single wand alone would have cost him 1,000 gold coins. And if it's the crystal fire staff we're talking about, then the price could easily go over 3,000 gold coins. He had encountered a similar situation like this in the game back on Earth. You had to spend money immediately after choosing to become a magician. 
the price to pay for magic skills training alone was already more expensive than the other professions, let alone the various other gears needed to practice magic. From Vincent's perspective, 2,000 gold coins wasn't just a random number he coughed up. It was roughly the calculated cost needed to study magic, but of course, he knew that this explanation alone could not conceal the Academy's unfair treatment towards commoners. But Eliud was unfamiliar with the world of magicians, and this caused him to erupt in anger. Vincent's countenance was relaxed and unmoved. He spread out his hands, leaned back into his seat and glibly said, There's nothing I can do about it. I'm not the one setting the price, after all. These are orders from the Academy Dean. I am simply the messenger. However, Eliud still had another trick up his sleeve. He pulled out a letter. I've got a recommendation letter from Duchess Alice. Vincent glanced up and saw a wax seal on the letter and immediately recognized the blooming rose insignia, it really was the seal of the Norton Kingdom's one and only Duchess. He looked at Eliud's strikingly handsome face, then laughed. Oh, what a blessing to be born good. Looking, he mocked. You could even get a noble to write you a recommendation letter. Well, according to the Academy Dean's orders, with a letter of recommendation from a noble, fees are cut down by 500 gold coins, making it 1,500 gold coins. Seeing this letter, Link suddenly saw how clever this young man really was. No commoner could earn 200 gold coins even if they worked their back off their whole life. Yet, this young man had somehow managed to earn that much by the age of 17. He had even obtained a letter of recommendation from a duchess to boot. Link knew that such things could have only been achieved through great sacrifice. But 1,500 gold coins was still an unacceptable amount of money for Eliard. He couldn't contain his anger any longer and finally lost his cool. This is blatant robbery, he shouted through clenched teeth, his face red. Vincent shook his head, unmoved. I'm warning you boy, you're lucky I'm in a good mood today, so I will let your impudence pass, he said with a sinister calm. But if you ever utter such drivel to a magician who's not as forgiving as I am, I assure you you'll pay for it in blood. Sensing that Eliard was going to continue arguing with the gatekeeper, Link quickly pulled him back by his arm. Right now they were nobodies, while on the other hand, the East Cove Higher Magic Academy was the most prestigious magic academy in the Kingdom of Norton. The academy's dean was also a level point seven master magician. If they lost their temper here, it would achieve nothing, and only leave a bad impression of themselves on the academy and the dean. Eliard was a commoner and he didn't have enough money for the tuition fees. Although there might have been some unfair treatment towards commoners on the academy's part, these were just the facts of life. No amount of shouting and arguing could change anything. Link became the first ever archmage in the gaming server back on earth all because he had full control of his emotions. He never complained nor held grudges against anyone, and he would never get riled up without good reason either. Whenever he was faced with a problem, he would stay calm and collected, and try to solve the issue with reason and logic. It was indeed this strong character of his that enabled Link to become the first ever Archmage. And for this same reason, when the God of Light dumped him into this strange unfamiliar world, not only was Link able to escape from Gladstone City alive, he was even able to save the city from ruin. And as he was then, his character remained just as strong now. Link understood that in order to abolish this unfair rule from the East Cove Higher Magic Academy, a few dissenting voices wouldn't amount to anything. Real change would only come when everyone was forced to notice the absurdity of the rule. With a slight tug from Link, Eliard slowly came to his senses, but his eyes had already turned red. It wasn't that he had never experienced society's unfair treatments before. In fact, under normal circumstances, he wouldn't lose control over his emotions so easily, but this matter was too close to his heart. He couldn't just give in. He had fought tooth and nail just to get to this point. He had endured unimaginable pain and many hardships just to earn those 200 gold coins. To earn the money, he undertook dangerous missions. 
because he had no fighting skills, he had to navigate dangerous investigative assignments in which he had only a 1 in 10 chance of surviving. Apart from those missions, he also did all kinds of businesses, frequently receiving extortion threats from ruffians and rogues. He still managed to save his money though, copper by copper. Ever since he was 10, except for when he was invited to dine with his friends, he would only have three coarse wheat buns a day, and nothing else. Sometimes, when he felt that he was not getting enough nutrients, he would go to the river in the middle of the night and catch some small fish and shrimp to eat. He could only do this at night because he was too busy working during the day. He wore the same clothing for three years. Even the old horse he rode was not actually his. It was, in fact, a parting gift from a friend. When he had heard of the East Cove Higher Magic Academy's prejudice against commoners, he knew he had to obtain a recommendation letter from a noble by any means necessary. To that end, he swallowed his pride and slept with that fat, ugly duchess for a whole month. He endured this humiliating and demeaning experience every night, casting his dignity aside. He had suffered through hell, and he had sacrificed everything that mattered all to chase his dream of becoming a magician, to ensure that his natural talents wouldn't go to waste, and to prove himself and stand ahead above the rest. But now that he had finally earned enough money, obtained that recommendation letter, and showed up at the door of the academy full of hope, reality had once again dealt another blow to his chest. Simple words plainly uttered had raised the goal of admission into the academy to unattainable heights. In the end, all of his hard work had amounted to nothing. Should he start over and try to earn more money again? By the time he earned 1,500 gold coins, he would already be over 20 years old. If luck wasn't on his side, he might just die on his missions before that. The next few years of his life were critical for magic training. How could he just throw them all away? At that moment, the enraged, hurt, and hopeless young Eliard looked up at his dream right in front of him, but there was an impenetrable moat obstructing him. His eyes had unknowingly started to redden. A commoner chasing his own dream, how much more difficult can such a simple task be? Eliard balled up his fists, raised his chin, and forbade himself from showing any tears. He would not make a fool of himself in front of this glorified guard dog. But Vincent had long seen through him. He shook his head and chuckled while uttering these cold words, May I suggest a brilliant solution to your woes, boy. Why don't you just go back to Duchess Alice and serve her well? Who knows, she might end up paying all the fees for you. He he he. Eliard was so livid he shook. This matter was his biggest shame. Vincent's words had sliced through him and cut open the terrible scar in his heart. His face turned scarlet, his heart beat so hard it could jump out of his throat. He clenched his fists tightly, having only one thought in his head, whatever the consequences, he would beat this old man to a pulp. Just as his rage reached its peak, someone grabbed his arm. He struggled to break free, but the grip on his arm tightened. Let go of me. Eliard demanded. Link's voice cut through the fog that clouded his judgment. Eliard, don't bring yourself to ruin. This voice was like a cold splash of water to the face. Eliard's struggle gradually became weaker and weaker. Eliard turned his head and came face to face with the young man who was then quietly staring back at him, gently shaking his head. Link's eyes glimmered softly. His face was ordinary and plain, yet the young man emanated a spirit that could calm a heart at its wildest as if there was nothing in this world that could provoke or disturb him. As calm as a still lake, as piercing as a knife's blade. This moment, this scene would forever be etched into Eliard's heart. Many years from now, whenever he was in a fury, in doubt or in despair, this memory would emerge again and again to remind him how a true magician should act in the face of this cold, cruel world. Chapter 33 A Glimmer of Sunlight in a Cold Cruel World, 2, You Are Listening at NovelFull.Audio Translator Nyo I. Bo Studio Editor Nyo I. Bo Studio Iliard Calm Down Although his spirits remained gloomy, he was still able to keep himself under control. 
When Link was sure that Eliard wouldn't lose his temper anymore, he stepped forward and gave Vincent a reverend magician's bow. Mr. Vincent, may I ask, how do I prove my own insight in magic? He respectfully asked. Simple, all you need to do is write a thesis that shows your understanding of the world and the universe. Vincent closed his eyes and lazily rocked in his chair. That good dot looking young man had calmed down, but really, he was a bit disappointed. Had the boy dared to raise his hand, Vincent would have gladly carved a few magic runes on that pretty little face. Oh, could you be a bit more specific? Link's attitude was deferential, and that made Vincent happy. Your thesis need not be about magic, as long as you show a unique perspective and a deep deductive power, and if this thesis of yours receives approval of one of the tutors, you will be accepted into the academy. But of course, the tuition fees would still be 2,000 gold coins, or if you come from a noble family, 1,000 gold coins. I see. Link was deep in thought for about five seconds, then he had come up with an idea. He then said in a tone full of regard, Mr. Vincent, sir, thank you very much for your guidance. Ha, now that is a young man befitting of a magician. Vincent leaned back in his chair on the courtyard. He nodded slightly, then looked at Eliard and said, you, on the other hand, are just too brash. That attitude of yours needs some mending, otherwise, you'll be regretting it when it's too late. Eliard snorted, then turned his head around. He felt his blood boil again from the sight of that self-assured old geezer. Link stepped backward a few steps until he reached Eliard's side. Let's go back for now, he said softly. Eliard nodded. His face was pale, but he still followed behind Link. He felt as if he couldn't face his friend. He had thought that he could enter the academy, then somehow help Link. But now, all his plans had crumbled. Once they were about 100 feet away from the school, Link consoled Eliard with a smile. Come on, stop being angry, he was just a level point two magician. Once you enter the academy, I'm sure you could easily surpass him with your level of talent. When that day comes, he'd definitely flatter you like a lapdog. I'm afraid there's no way for me to enter the academy. I'll never be able to get 1,500 gold coins, that's just too expensive. Eliard's face was full of dejection. He was just hit with a huge roadblock, and he had given up hope. I have 200 gold coins, I can live comfortably as a commoner, marry a beautiful girl, live a decent life without becoming a magician, how bad can that be? The idea flashed through his mind. As these thoughts ran through his head, Eliard let out a long sigh. All these years, magic had been his only goal in life, yet it had always brought him misery and pain, never once an ounce of happiness. He simply couldn't bear it anymore. Link saw the way Eliard looked and could guess what was on his mind. He softly patted Eliard's shoulder, smiled, and said, Don't worry, my friend, it's just a matter of fees. You don't have to be so gloomy. I've still got 1,300 gold coins with me, I can lend it to you, and add that to your 200 gold coins, then you'd have just enough to enter the academy. What did you say? Eliard couldn't help but gasp. He thought he misheard. This was 1,300 gold coins, not silver coins, not copper coins, gold coins. That was an amount of money that normal people couldn't even imagine. It was about the amount that a few thousand commoners in River Cove town needed for food and other necessities in a year. And now, this young man whom he had just met had offered this much money to him. He was dumbfounded and was unsure of what to think. He was a mixed bag of emotions. Happiness, alarm, doubt, worry, and reluctance. Link was still smiling. Are you afraid that I might have unreasonable demands in return for helping you? Eliard fell silent, but the silence was full with agreement. He wasn't a naive child who hadn't experienced such things. He knew no one would offer kindness and help for nothing, and he knew not to expect free pies to fall out of the sky into his hands, especially not when it came from nobles. This was what Duchess Alice had taught him. 
Even though she was as pretty as a pig, in the month that he had spent with her, Eliard had, in fact, learned some valuable lessons. Link could guess the thoughts running through Eliard's mind, so he explained, You know I'm a Viscount's son. But I'm the third son, I have no rights to inherit his title, only a meager amount of his money. In that way, I'm just like you, I have to rely on myself and work my way up. You see, between us both, you're the one who can easily enter the academy. So what I'm thinking is, if you could enter the academy first, and then become a stellar student, then maybe you could recommend me or find an opportunity for me to enter the academy too. And as for the fees, well, don't you worry, my father is a viscount after all, isn't he? They had only known each other for a day, so Link knew not to spew any nonsense about friendship and loyalty. If he did say such things, it would only arouse Eliard's suspicions. So, he stated his own plans honestly and clearly. He thought his plans made sense, and he was sure that Eliard would understand that it's a win.win -win situation for both of them. But even so, there was no denying that this was a great act of kindness on Link's part. Aren't you afraid that I just run off with the money? Eliard was moved, but he still didn't understand why Link would risk doing such a thing. After all, they had only known each other for a day. What made Link trust him so much? He understood that 1,300 gold coins was still a hefty amount of money, even for a viscount's son. He suspected that it was Link's whole inheritance, and if Eliard ran off with this money, it would leave Link destitute. Link's father would not lift a finger to help, Eliard was sure of that. He knew the nobles well, he knew how heartless they could be. Link smiled and looked into Eliard's eyes and plainly said, Eliard, your natural talents in magic are immense. I can clearly see in your eyes that you are fully committed towards magic. I know that if you were to have a chance to learn magic, you would become a master magician one day. Is a master magician's honor worth just 1,300 gold coins? If it turns out to be so, well I'll blame my own judgment and my own stupidity then. Eliard was speechless for a long while. Then, he bowed low in front of Link, and that striking face of his turned solemn. Link, from this day onwards, you are my lifelong friend. I will never betray your trust. Link patted Eliard's shoulder and said, Don't worry about it, my friend. Things won't be as bad as it seems. I know some aristocrats, I'm sure they would write me a recommendation letter. Plus, I've got an idea for a thesis that could prove my knowledge of magic. Oh, what is it about? asked Eliard, full of interest. Link picked up a stone from the ground, flung it upwards, then after a few seconds, the stone fell back down to the ground. He then looked at Eliard and said, Can you guess what it is? Eliard stared at him wide-eyed. He thought and thought, but was simply befuddled, so he scratched his head and said, What is it? What do you think made the stone fall back down to the ground? Link replied. He came from Earth, so he had a basic knowledge of scientific theories, even though and he hadn't been a very studious person back then. But now that he had a much more vigorous soul, he could easily understand what used to confuse him so much before. To write a thesis that would grant him admission into the academy, Link had the wealth of knowledge from the scientific masterminds from Earth to learn from, so he felt no pressure at all. But with just this one question, Eliard felt as if he fell into an endless pit. In the beginning, he thought the question had an obvious answer, but the more deeply he thought about it, the more perplexed he became. With a puzzled look on his face, he repeated Link's words, You're right, why would a stone always fall to the ground? Why didn't it continue flying upwards? Why didn't it outshoot horizontally? What kind of force always pulled it back down to the ground? Chapter 34 From the stones to the sun, the stars, and the universe you are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Nyo Idapio Studio Editor Nyo Idapio Studio with Link's help Eliard managed to get 1,500 gold coins for the tuition fees. Because he also possessed prodigal talents in magic, he was naturally accepted into the academy without further ado. Link, on the other hand, fell on hard times. 
He had given almost all of his money to Eliard, and now there were only six gold coins left for him. Even though he already had an idea for his thesis, Link knew that his academic aptitude in the previous world was nothing to shout about. He wasn't a particularly bad student, but he was far from being the top, and he only had a basic understanding of the things he'd learned. He might now be gifted with remarkable intelligence, but in order to produce a sound thesis, he would still need a lot of time and mental exertion. Consequently, he had no time at all to think of ways to earn money. To save the money he still had left, he moved from the best room in the River Cove Inn to a small attic on the top floor. The rent for the attic was very cheap, only 50 coppers a night. The room was always drafty and it was very small too, barely over a hundred square feet. It also had no bed. It originally didn't have a table either but Link managed to persuade the innkeeper to put in a table and chair, with an agreement that he would pay half a month's rent for each. It wasn't a fair deal, but Link didn't mind it much because he had no need for luxury in order to survive, a place to stay, a roof over his head, and he's satisfied. He went to the sundry shop to buy a quill pen, some ink, and some goatskin paper. These cost him nine silver coins. Then he bought some more daily necessities until, at last, he was left with only one gold coin and one silver coin in his money bag. One gold coin is worth ten silver coins. He still needed money to eat, so he must start skimping more. Presently, he had two major problems to solve. One was the thesis paper that he had to write, and the other was the 1,500 gold coins for the tuition. Well, I guess I'll finish writing that thesis first, then I'll worry about the money later. I'll find a way when the time comes. Eliard was completely oblivious to the problems Link was facing, of course. He was now staying in the academy dorm and had started learning magic. East Cove enforced a closed-dot-door policy on its students. Once you're inside, you wouldn't be allowed to go out of the cove without special permission. So for a long period of time, Link wouldn't be able to see Eliard, they could only communicate through letters. But Link thought this was fine, he didn't plan to let Eliard know all the problems he was facing anyway. After tidying up his things and settling down in his new room, he sat down on the tattered little chair and started to write his first thesis essay. He dipped the quill in ink, then stared out through a small window in the attic. He saw that Gervinth forest bathed in sunlight. What should I write about, he mumbled to himself. He thought about it for a few minutes, then scribbled down in a flowing hand, from falling stones to the sun, the moon, and the stars. The Theory of Universal Interactive Forces Since he was going to write a thesis, he might as well shoot for the stars and attempt to write something grand, so grand that it would surely grab everyone's attention. Link was recalling his memories from the previous world and was surprised at how clear and accurate his recollection of that distant place was. There was no confusion nor fragmented pieces of memories. He thought he would have completely forgotten all about the law of universal gravitation, but in fact, when he tried to recall it in detail, he realized that these bits of knowledge were like treasures buried in the corner of his mind, all waiting for him to do a little digging to retrieve them. There was mathematics in the world firemen too. In fact, their mathematics had progressed to a decent extent, although not in the same path that it took on Earth. Here, mathematics was only a branch of magical studies, a mere tool for research. To put it more accurately, magic studies covered every field of knowledge in firemen, and mathematics was just a small area branching out of it. The young man whose body Link now inhabited had studied in the Fleming's Academy for quite some time. He might not have learned true magic, but he had a decent understanding of the basic foundations of it. What knowledge the young man had gained was enough for Link to start writing his thesis. And perhaps because he already had a solid understanding of the basics, his analysis and deductions went smoothly. He found that he could effortlessly focus his attention, easily ignoring any stray thoughts or distractions, and all his mental processes were concentrated solely on the thesis. Because of that, as he began to write, he was completely immersed in the task, forgetting the flow of time. Under this kind of sustained rigorous thinking, 
Link began to logically analyze the hypothesis of the omnipresent force's mutual attraction that he had postulated earlier. At first, Link thought that all would go according to plan, he would put in all his efforts into writing an impressive thesis that would leave everyone in awe, then he would find a way to get the money for the fees, and voila. Into the East Cove Academy, he would go. But just as theory and practice usually clash, Link realized, as he went further into the deductions for his thesis, that he had a problem. Link knew that he would eventually arrive at the universal gravitational law at the conclusion of his thesis, he thought that it wouldn't be difficult to come up with the final mathematical equation for the universal gravitational law. But as it stood, the further and further he went along the path that logic set out for him, the more he realized that he was actually falling down a completely bizarre rabbit hole. As he came back to reality, he saw that the goatskin parchment was full of scribblings of mathematical formulas, of mana runes equations, and he was nearly brought to the brink of insanity. I was only trying to infer the law of universal gravitation, but what on earth has it come to? A ghost of the gravitational law did actually emerge on the paper, but so did remnants of the theory of relativity, and many other perplexing things that Link knew nothing about. And so. Well, naturally, he was stumped. He didn't know how to go forward with this line of thought. What he didn't realize was how postulations like the universal gravitational law or the theory of relativity, if you scrutinize them to their logical roots, all define the nature of the fabric of space and time in imperfect ways. They might describe nature in fascinating detail, but ultimately there were cracks and flaws and they were not truly universal. There were always exceptions and circumstances where the laws broke down and became useless. Link also didn't realize that his current mental capacity was much more powerful than he suspected, frighteningly so, in fact. As he followed the path of pure logic, his mind was automatically repairing the flaws and cracks in the theories until it discovered a handful of novel equations that even Link himself had no full comprehension of its significance. But even when these strange equations did describe the nature of reality, they still came short of doing it perfectly, and it was this imperfection that rendered it befuddling and impenetrable. To the inexperienced Link, this was just too much, and he was unsurprisingly overwhelmed. He tapped at his warm forehead, then cleared his head completely of the complex ruminations and stacked the sheets of paper away in a neat pile. His stomach grumbled, so he decided to have a meal, then he would take a walk outside to unwind and breathe easy for a while. Maybe then he would find some solutions for the problems in his thesis. That's just how Link was. When confronted with a problem, he would never back down or give up, instead, he would step back and think up of ways to solve them to the best of his ability. If the problems were too big to see the light at the end of the tunnel, then he would forge on any way like a snail, slowly but surely. Rome wasn't built in a day, so I can't expect to wrap up a grand thesis in a day either. Maybe all I need is a rest, he thought, to soothe himself. Once he got to the inn hall, he took a loaf of coarse wheat bread and a cup of water and settled down to eat on his own. Once his stomach was filled, Link set out and headed for the waterfront of the River Cove town. In the Gervinth forest, the clear river flowed rapidly, the sun beamed in its full radiance, the crisp autumn breeze blew, and the forest itself was alive with sounds of birdsongs. All of this had put his mind at ease. After half an hour, Link was suddenly struck with an idea for his thesis. He rushed back to the attic of the inn and immediately went back to work. But after a few hours, he got stuck again, and no matter how hard he thought about it there was still no solution in sight. He realized that it was already dark, so he ate dinner and decided to rest his mind. He pulled out a book from the pendant and started to read. Link had mastered the level point zero spell Fireball, but he noticed some shortcomings in the structure of the magic in the spell. He thought of attempting to fix the flaws but ended up getting interrupted by Yilliard. This time, with no one to interfere, he fully applied himself to the problem and threw himself into an experiment. With the new moon wand in his hand and a slight quiver in his heart, his mana started to flow into the wand, its tip glowing in a dim light of magic. Just like that, Link started to focus on perfecting the magical structure of the fireball spell. Little by little, 
the mana flowed out of the wand's tip and began to build up the structure of the spell. As the key magic structure was fully formed, the fire element in the air began to coalesce. Then Link began to use his modified magic structure. But he lost control, and with one soft pop, the half-dot-formed fireball collapsed. This was startling, but Link knew he wouldn't get it right the first time anyway. He started analyzing the modified process that he used from scratch, and once he was sure of the revised procedure, he repeated the experiment. Pop. Three seconds later, the immature fireball once again collapsed and dispersed. Again. Another pop. But this time he could sustain it for four seconds. This meant that there was 80% more progress. Good. Again. Pop. One more time. Pop. He repeated this process about 50 times, but without succeeding even once. In the end, the fireball collapsed when it was around 98% fully dot formed. Link decided to temporarily stop the experiment. Why do I always lose control of the mana at the very end? He wondered, I must be missing something here. He thought back to when there was a change in mana during the experiment. He considered it thoroughly for more than half an hour before he was suddenly struck by the recollection of a simple explanation he had once encountered in a magic textbook. Hastily, Link scoured the room for his magic textbooks, and after a few minutes, he finally found three of them. The Nature of Mana, Theories of Mana Turbulence and Mana Scattering and Interference He relied on the original Link's blurry memory, flipping the pages of the books page by page. In no time at all, he found what he was looking for. Mana Scattering Equation and Structural Interference Chart, 9 Circumstances Where a Mana Turbulence Would Occur But of course. I've made so many mistakes. Once he was done reading, Link realized how coarse and superficial his understanding of the nature of mana was. Attempting to perfect magic structure with this level of knowledge was indeed an act of ignorance. Since my predecessors have provided me with so many stepping stones to climb on, I'd be foolish not to use them. Dot even the great scientist Newton had once claimed that he was able to see so far because he was standing on the shoulders of giants, so there was no reason why Link shouldn't do the same. To ignore the great works that had been done before him and attempt to discover everything on his own from scratch, that would truly be the work of an imbecile. Chapter 35 Links, Glass Orbs, you are listening at NovelFull.audio. Translator. Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor. Nyo I.B.O. Studio Magic was a rigorous subject, anything that was written in the books, meant that it had been experimentally proven countless times before. Why was this so important? For a simple reason, any mistakes made in spellcasting could trigger serious accidents. This was a matter of life or death, and those magicians who were not scrupulous enough in their experiments would be automatically eliminated by the accidents they caused. Link set aside his wishes to modify and improve spells and started to attentively read the magic textbooks, absorbing the wisdom and knowledge passed down by his precedents. As he read, he was deeply engrossed by it. He even forgot about his thesis. There were 63 magic textbooks in his pendant, all of them about the foundation knowledge of magic. The facts recorded in these textbooks were approved by all magicians and had been proven true by hundreds and thousands of experiments. So even if the knowledge level was basic, it was the accumulation of knowledge and wisdom from over the years. Some even paid for it with by their lives. Link read closely, and his extraordinary memory recorded each detail into his mind. His newly obtained intellectual power had also made him understand the philosophies in the books easily. He had even forgotten to sleep and neglected to eat. After two weeks, Link had gotten considerably thin from eating just three pieces of coarse wheat bread a day. His eyes had sunken into his face, and his figure was gaunt. But his pair of black eyes now looked like a still lake, serene in its depth, filled with wisdom. In these two weeks, Eliud had written two letters to him, telling him of his progress in the academy. Eliud had truly impressive talents. In just a short period of time, 
he had mastered one level.0 spell and was even accepted by a level.5 mage tutor called Moira as her protege. The moment Link read that he grumbled. Moira, that sounds like a woman's name. What a blessing it is to be born so handsome. But Iliad was fitting in nicely in the academy, and that was a good thing. Link, on the other hand, would tell Iliad of interesting news from the River Cove town. He always made sure to write in cheerful tones, not once did he reveal any hardships he was facing. He would also include questions he had about magic in the letters to Iliard, hoping that he could help him with them. Of course, Link didn't actually expect Iliard to answer them himself. Didn't that lucky bastard have a tutor to help him? Iliard's guilt and anxiety were greatly relieved each time he received Link's letters. While he was settling down in the academy, he constantly worried about Link, and would be awaiting news from him with concern and trepidation. But now that he knew Link wasn't doing so bad, Iliard felt much better. As for the questions that Link posed in the letters, he didn't understand much of them, still, he was willing to do anything to help Link. In truth, any opportunity to help Link made him feel gratified. So he took the questions to his tutor, Moira. Moira had been taking special care of Iliard. She would answer every question that he asked her. Iliard was not oblivious to the special perks he was receiving. Iliard would then copy down Moira's answers to the questions in his letters to Link. This way, it was as if Link also had a level.5 magician mentoring him as he was studying. This kind of communication was a big part of why Link could finish reading 63 basic textbooks in two weeks. Gently flipping the last page of the last magic textbook he read, The Way of the Magician, there was the name of the author on the book, Bryant, a master magician from 300 years ago. He was the only human to ever become a legendary magician. My successors, we cross the barrier of time and communicate through words, and these are my words, remember, magic can give you anything, including eternal life. Forge on ahead down this path, keep moving forward and maybe one day we will meet. The message seemed to have a hidden meaning, but Bryant had been dead for 300 years. The whole of nobility in the Norton Kingdom had attended his funeral. There were clear records of it in the historical documents, there was no cause to doubt the authenticity of those documents. So Link just took the message as a dead man's witticism and didn't think more of it. Gently he placed the way of the magician together with all the books he had read. Not only did he finish reading them, he had also remembered every detail and understood and digested each piece of information. Right now, Link was no longer a complete novice in magic, nor was he the underachieving student of the Fleming's Lower Magic Academy. He had now truly grasped the essential knowledge that is the foundation of magic. And so, it was time for Link to revisit the idea of modifying the fireball spell structure. He now had many fresh ideas to commence from. He took out his new moon wand then closed his eyes and concentrated. The insights he achieved after two weeks of study swiftly emerged in his mind. These insights then merged with his knowledge of spell structure of fireball, and like pouring hot oil to the fire, an explosion of inspiration and ideas resulted. Five minutes later, because of Link's amazing imaginative power, a novel spell structure was fully formed in his mind. Dot then, Link opened his eyes. And in that instant, the pair of eyes which had been dulled by ailing mana came back to life. He reached out his hand holding the wand, and mana flowed into it. Runes on the wand lit up one by one before finally, the new moon at the tip of the wand glowed too. In the air right in front of the wand, a speck of light appeared. When observed carefully, the fire elements in the speck were actually rotating at a high speed, but it wasn't an ordinary type of rotation at all. It was an internal rotation, with the structure of a whirlpool. It was as if in the heart of the light speck there was a black hole that sucked in fire elements from its surroundings, and the rotation of the fire element was a way to maintain the stability of the structure. A second later, the speck of light expanded to the size of a glass marble, the usual scale of a normal fireball. But there was a difference. The fireballs that Link used to produce were white and waves surrounded it, emitting a misty light. 
but this one had a blue core, its surface was very smooth, and no heat streamed out of the surface. It looked exactly like a glass marble. The spell was completed. Link opened the attic window. Outside, sunlight shone brilliantly. He took aim at a rubber tree about 100 feet away. Then he pointed the wand at the tree's direction, and instantly the fireball shot out. Bang! There was an explosion, and the fireball flew through the air and hit the tree trunk accurately. Wood pieces scattered in all directions and a teacup dot sized hole appeared on the trunk. For normal fireballs, the distance they crossed was no more than 60 feet. Even if the fireball was boosted by a superior wand, the impact would not have been any more than that of a large firecracker, at most skinning off the outer bark of the tree. This unique fireball from Link was absolutely beyond the strength of a normal fireball, not just in the distance it traveled, but also in its destructive power. The greatest distance it could travel should be around 200 feet, and its power could probably rival a level point one fireball. If I used the fire crystal staff the power and distance may increase a little. The mana consumption is low as well, so even in my condition, I could release 24 of these consecutively. But the spell casting time has increased considerably, that's its only downside. Link could cast normal fireballs in as little as zero. Five seconds with the aid of the gaming system. But now that the modified fireball had more complicated structures, and also because it wasn't stabilized yet, Link had to use more effort to maintain its form. He needed eight seconds the first time he cast the spell. Never mind that. With practice, I'm sure I can do it faster. The moment he set his mind to something, he jumped into it immediately. He started to practice the modified fireball just as he practiced the normal fireball before. He gathered the elements at the tip of the wand and then absorbed his mana back without releasing it. He kept on practicing and applied all of his concentration into it. Half a day had gone by, and the results were outstanding. Link waved his wand gently, and instantly a blue glass fireball would appear at the tip of the wand. Then, as he lifted the wand, the fireball disappeared. He then waved the wand again, and the fireball appeared. He raised it, and it disappeared once more. It happened so quickly that no one would be able to believe it. He was able to do it as fast as he would with the normal fireball spell. But Link knew that in truth it was still slower, even though it was only by a slight margin. If the normal fireball spell took 0.05 seconds, then the fastest limit for the modified version should be around 0.07 seconds. The more complicated the spell structure, the more time it took to construct it, and so the more time it took to cast the spell. This was a simple universal pelinkable. However, for this modified version of Fireball, the spellcasting speed might be slightly slower at 0.07 seconds, but the accumulated energy rivaled that of a level 0.1 spell, the difference in scale was almost incomparable. It was also effective from an impressive distance of about 200 feet, yet the mana consumption was equal to that of just one normal fireball. This was indeed a terrifying spell. Spellcasting speed could still be decreased. I'll practice a little more. Even decreasing the spellcasting speed by a little bit was still valuable because it could massively influence the outcome of a battle. Therefore, Link would not settle and pushed himself very hard to improve his speed as much as he could. So he continued to practice. Link spent the next three hours modifying the fireball spell. He practiced it until he couldn't feel any more progress, until he'd reached the limit. Link then noticed a notification activated in the interface. He checked it and found that it was an announcement from the gaming system. Player has successfully modified level 0 .0 fireball. Please name the new spell. Link chuckled, visibly amused and excited that he had the power to name new spells. He thought of the solid and vitreous appearance of the modified fireball, so he said, call it glass orb then. Link's glass orbs, huh. Spell named, glass orb. Player successfully modified a level point zero spell, one omni point rewarded. Ha, I even get omni point rewards from this, not bad at all. 
Link was even more motivated now. He now had 106 Omni points. But because he was still under the influence of ailing mana, even if he spent all of his points to increase his maximum mana, he could only get to 106 maximum mana points. Only three months later would things recover. He didn't need a lot of mana now, though, so he decided to reserve these Omni points for later use. Each point was like a card under his sleeve, so he thought it was wiser to have as many Omni points on hand as possible. After he finished reading the magic textbooks and successfully modified Fireball, Link's mind finally went back to his thesis. This time, because he received lots of new ideas from the textbooks, he resumed his work on the law of universal gravitation. It developed very quickly, until the deduction process had gone too deep that the law devolved into something completely unrecognizable. In the end, he couldn't even comprehend the conclusions that his own deductions had brought him to. But this time, Link's deduction ended much quicker than expected, not because there were no more ideas, but instead because he had run out of goatskin papers. The ink was used up as well. It was time for him to restock his stationaries. He fumbled at his money pouch, then felt embarrassed of his own situation. He had very little money left, only about three silver coins. I need to earn some money. His pouch was almost empty. If he didn't go out and earn some money now, he might need to resort to begging in the streets soon. Chapter 36 The Forest Bandits Ordeal You Are Listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.B.O. Studio The only way he knew to earn money was by utilizing his magic. To use magic, Link would need a wand. Currently, there were two wands in his possession. The new moon wand and the fire crystal staff. The former was a recognizable work of a master magician, while the latter was a bulky thing with obvious dark elf features. None of them were suitable to be exposed publicly. After careful consideration, Link made up his mind to use the new moon wand. But of course, he would first conceal the wand under the cover of camouflage. He then decided to spend one Omni point to purchase a new spell. Transmutation level 0, .0 spell effects. A low dot level enchantment spell. Transforms the appearance of one object into another without altering the innate nature and shape of the original object. Once he received the spell, Link swathed the new moon wand under layers of linen rags, completely covering the original appearance. He then foraged some rubber tree twigs and put the thickly covered wand on the twigs. He picked up the fire crystal staff and cast the transmutation spell. A rippling, translucent ball of light appeared at the tip of the staff, Link pointed it towards the new moon wand. Transmutation The ball of light hit the wand. The brownish surface of the rags began to show minute changes as faint lines of wood grain began to appear. But this wasn't enough. Casting the transmutation spell once was not going to completely change the rags into a wooden stick. Transmutation. 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 He rapidly cast the spell five times successively. Now the rags that covered the wand were completely transformed into a plain wooden stick. The stick had many pores, though, so it wouldn't affect spellcasting in any way. Still, the surface was a bit too rough, so he smoothed it out with some grains of sand. Now, the once magnificent looking new moon wand had completely transformed into an ordinary looking wooden stick. There. Now I can use it. As the wand camouflaging business was done, Link suddenly felt peckish, so he went to the inn hall and got himself, as usual, a long loaf of coarse wheat bread for five coppers. But he thought the occasion called for a drink, so he spent another ten coppers on a mug of ale. He had been eating the same thing for half a month so his tongue might have forgotten how to taste. A mug of ale would certainly be a nice change. Hey, Link. What's the matter with you today? the inn servant teased as he handed the young man a mug of ale filled to the brim. Another voice called out from the other side of the room, Link, you'll soon become as thin as a bamboo rod. You can't go on like that, you know. It was the drunkard Tormund. 
He was a regular of the inn who would spend the first coin he earned on drinks. Once drunk he'd go home and beat his wife. The two had been fighting over this habit of his for many years until his wife couldn't take it anymore and ran off with another man. This didn't stop Tormun from going back to his old habit, though. Alcohol was his true love, after all. Say, Link. You're cooped up the whole damn day in that little attic. What could you be doing in there? Come on, share it with us, another regular chuckled. He had spent half a month there, so everyone in the inn knew him. In fact, by now the whole town had heard rumors about the oddball at the inn. Link's only response to these jeering questions was to tell the truth. I'm a magician, and I'm working on my magic skills. To his surprise, laughter rang out through the entire hall in response. Ha! If you're a magician, then I'm a wise sage, slurred Tormund the drunkard. The rest of the hall joined in on the laughter. Link had been telling them the truth many times before, but no one ever took him seriously. Because of River Cove's proximity to the East Cove Higher Magic Academy, its inhabitants were accustomed to the sights of magicians from the school. In their eyes, magicians wore magnificent robes, spent their money liberally, always carried sticks with them they called wands, there was a certain mysterious air about them too, as if they were fully shrouded in an enigmatic aura. This link, on the other hand, wore tattered rags for a robe, he had sold the grey robe for money, had a body as thin and frail as twigs, he had the pallor of boiled cabbage. In addition, no one had ever seen him do any kind of magic before. Only fools would take his claim of being a magician seriously. Link understood all that, and so he never argued. To him, what the townspeople thought of him was completely irrelevant. So long as they did not hinder him in his quests, the whole town could take him for a beggar and he wouldn't lose sleep over it. He knew that it was all beneath him. An eagle never concerned itself over the opinions of chickens, so he never bothered with explanations. And so, all Link did was laugh, then he carried his food to a seat in the corner and sat down and ate. He took a bite out of the loaf, then washed it down with a swig of ale. All throughout this scene, his spirits were calm and utterly undisturbed. The inn halls crowd occasionally threw some remarks on Link from time to time, but seeing as they got no reaction or response from him, they just mumbled something to themselves and moved on to town gossip. Suddenly there was a sound of heavy footsteps from outside the door, as the light flowing into the inn was blocked. Darkness momentarily swept over the room, the change causing everyone inside to be silent. Every head turned towards the door. Even Link did the same. There at the entrance stood an enormous brute striding into the hall, he was almost seven. Feet tall. His arms were bigger than Link's thighs, his hair was a netted mess, his face coarse and rugged, and his beard bushy and long. He was wearing grey leather armor with metal plates sewn over his heart and ribs. He was also carrying a war hammer on his shoulder made of pure iron. The handle and its head were eight inches long, it couldn't have weighed less than 150 pounds. But that wasn't the only thing the brute was carrying. On his back was a thick metal shield, it was at least two inches thick, also made of pure iron, and it couldn't have been easy to carry around either. Link could guarantee that if he was ever hit by a gentle swing of that hammer, he'd be as dead as a doornail. The brute walked into the hall as if he were a war tank invading enemy territory, each heavy step stomping loudly onto the floor's wooden planks. It was only when the brute was well inside the hall that everyone noticed the two people behind him. One of them was an archer, about thirty years of age. His robust physique was also completely covered in leather armor. The other was a woman, around twenty-seven or twenty-eight years old. Crowning her face was a full head of fiery, red hair. She wore a full dot body leather armor suit that hugged her figure, revealing enticing curves on a body so stunning she could easily spike any man's hormones. Dot every pair of eyes in the hall were latched onto them. The wretched drunkard Tormund couldn't peel his eyes off of the woman from the moment she appeared. He didn't even notice the drool spilling out of his mouth. This drunkard hadn't touched a woman for years, his eyes would have bulged out even if he'd seen a so, 
female pig, let alone a beautiful woman like this. The woman appeared to be a swordswoman, seeing that she had a one-dot-handed sword on her back. She was extremely perceptive of her surroundings, easily sensing the drooling torment's gaping stare. Immediately she glared at him with her cold deep dot blue eyes. Tormun was frightened to his senses. Ah, he gasped, then dropped the drink in his hand. He didn't dare look up at her again. The rest of the crowd in the inn was spooked as well, and none of them dared to stare anymore. These three are definitely professionals, Link thought, there's a strong murderess aura emanating from that woman. She must have killed many people before. But I sense no darkness or evil coming from them, so I guess they must be roaming mercenaries undertaking missions in exchange for money. Seeing that the in crowd was completely intimidated by them, they ordered their food and began a discussion as if no one else was around. They were boisterous and completely indiscreet, so Link could clearly hear every word they were saying. There's just no way, no way in hell we could ever fight him. This Victor scum is a wimpy little wuss. He'd just hide in his little cave and never come out. It's too dangerous if we go in there, it's too small to fit my bow, so I can't aim right. It's just impossible, the archer said in a tone of exasperation as he took a big bite of smoked beef. Hey, stop being so gloomy. Of course, it's a little bit more dangerous than usual, but don't forget how sweet the reward is going to be. And we've come a hundred miles. Are we really going to just give up now, the woman responded. She then turned to the giant brute, what do you say, Jacker? The brute had a craggy face, but his demeanor was surprisingly gentle. He carefully cut a piece of meat and put it in his mouth, then slowly chewed the food. Hearing the woman's question, he considered it for a while, then said, we need a helper. Victor is a level point three assassin, he's also developed combat aura. Now that he's on his toes, he'll make a terrible opponent. Helper, the archer spat out with a laugh, what kind of help can we get in River Cove? Unless that if we could get one of those magicians in the East Cove Academy. Gildern, are you out of your mind? The red dot haired woman immediately countered, what kind of magician can we afford? Even if we give up all the reward we get they might still not pay us any attention, and don't even think about them risking the danger with us. I was only joking. The archer pursed his lips, then lowered his head and concentrated on eating. Afterwards, the three mercenaries continued talking. Most of what they said was about their mission and the mission's goal. The name Victor was mentioned a lot. But even after half a day of discussion, they didn't seem to come to any solution. But instead, the one who did come up with an idea was Link, who was listening intently their issue. He remembered exactly where he had heard the name Victor before. Victor, the leader of the Dark Brotherhood, a band of rogues, robbers, and ruffians. The Brotherhood's most recognizable feature was their blood.red masks. In fact, the bandits that attacked Iliard in the forest had belonged to this Brotherhood. At that point in time, the Dark Brotherhood wreaked havoc in the western part of the Gervinth Forest. It was the most powerful band of the underworld west of Gervinth Forest, and Victor was at its helm. His words held more power than the mayor of River Cove. If he wanted someone dead, one word and that person would not live to see the next sunrise. But of course, like any underworld organization, the reason Victor could get so powerful in a town so near to Spring City was that he had powerful political connections in the capital. Link remembered exactly how far up the power ladder this connection was, the Iron Duke. It wasn't that the Iron Duke directly supported the Dark Brotherhood, but even so, he did receive part of the loot and treasure from Victor, so he turned a blind eye to the Brotherhood's criminal activities. Naturally, this made Victor even bolder and more unscrupulous. While thinking about all this information, he suddenly remembered a thing called Victor's treasure trove. As an underworld leader, Victor naturally was paranoid about his own safety. He never kept his treasures in the banks of Norton Kingdom. He would instead hide them in a secret location, but he didn't hide all of his treasures in one place, though. Instead, like a squirrel, he would hide portions of his treasures in numerous different locations all over the Gervinth Forest. 
In the game, if a player was lucky, he could have a chance of picking up a map to the location of Victor's treasure trove. In fact, Link had picked one up once, and as he followed the path on the map, he eventually found 100 gold coins, which was equivalent to about $1,500, indeed a substantial amount of money. The locations of the treasures shown on the map were random, but according to the statistics in the game forum, there should at least be 20 or more locations where Victor buried his gold coins. If there were 100 gold coins in one location, then in 20 or more sites he would have collected enough money to pay the fees for the academy. For this reason, Link's interest was piqued the moment he heard the name Victor. His financial situation had become truly dire, so he had been listening intently and paying close attention to the three mercenaries. Just then, he received a notification in the interface. Mission activated. Assassination mission details. Kill the leader of the Dark Brotherhood Victor. Mission rewards. 10 Omni points ah, this is one mission I can't refuse. He waited patiently for the three mercenaries to finish their meal. Once they got up to leave the inn, he swiftly stood up and followed them. Once they were outside the inn Link hastened his footsteps and caught up with them. Hey, wait up, he shouted, is it true that you people are in need of a helper? Chapter 37 The Terrifying Power of the Glass Orbs You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Nyo Ida.bo Studio Editor Nyo Ida.bo Studio The River Cove in's Front Door The three members of the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries heard a voice, and they all simultaneously turned around. What they saw at the inn's entrance was a black dot haired youth of about 16 to 17 years of age, with a weak and gaunt figure. He was so frail dot looking that he looked like he might actually be blown away by the wind. He was clad in a dirty and tattered linen robe, and his leather boots were old and worn, all covered in mud and dirt. Ha, the archer, Gildern barked out a laugh, young chap, if you want to play house, you'd have to go find your brothers and sisters first. The red-dot-headed swordswoman did not waste her breath to taunt him, she went straight to rejection, young man, this isn't something you should get involved with. Jacker was the only one who stayed silent. He closely examined Link from head to toe. Link ignored the archer and the swordswoman, he focused instead on the colossus brute, Jacker. He knew that this warrior was the most important member of the mercenary band. If his guess was right, the one called Jacker must be their leader. What can you do? Jacker felt there was something special about this young man. He was too calm and collected, his black eyes were too deep and penetrating he didn't look like the average person at all. I am a magician, said Link with a laugh. The archer Gildern and the red-dot-headed swordswoman were both startled when they heard this. They began to scrutinize Link with new-dot-found interest, but no matter how they viewed him, they had just never seen such a decrepit-looking magician before. Jacker doubted Link's power and abilities, but he dared not underestimate him yet. He asked, what spells do you know? In the eyes of the average person, magicians were both mysterious and powerful. But Jacker was far from a normal person, he was a strong level. Three warrior, and a roving mercenary too. He'd seen extraordinary things common people could never imagine seeing. So even if he'd never personally experienced magic spells before, he had seen as many majestic and divine master magicians as decrepit and desperate wandering magicians. Even if this young man's claim as a magician was true, that still didn't guarantee that he possessed an awesome power. Chances were, he might only be capable of some level point zero spells and not much else. Wait here, I'll go get my wand. Link hurriedly said. His wand was actually right in his storage pendant, but storage gears were not supposed to be exposed publicly, so he turned around and went back to the attic. While he was gone, the archer Gildern pursed his lips and said, didn't expect him to even own a wand, I'm impressed. Hey Lucy, wanna bet? Lucy was the name of the red-dot-headed swordswoman. She laughed and said, bet on what? On how many spells this pipsqueak knows? My bet is that he only knows some level point zero spells. No way, who's going to bet against that? 
how powerful can that boy be, looking like that? If he'd known some level point one spells, he would have been in the East Cove Academy. Gildern chuckled and said, who knows? Didn't you hear what happened in Gladstone? They say the magician who saved the city was a young man just like our magician here, but he could cast a flame blast that single dot handedly defeated the bloody, handed demon. Lucy pouted her lips and said, Do you think such geniuses are walking about everywhere? That's enough, stop bickering. I think there's something peculiar about this young man, so don't be so quick to underestimate him, Jacker waved his hand to stop his comrades from taunting the young man further. The two turned quiet. Jacker was someone they both held in high regard. At the same time, Link returned from the inn and in his hand, he was holding a wooden stick that should be his wand. That's his wand. That's clearly just a stick. Gildern whispered. Link pretended not to hear, he walked towards Jacker, smiled and said, so far the only spell that I've mastered is fireball, but I think you'll find my spellcasting skills useful for your mission. Just fireball. Jacker was disappointed as it really was just a level point zero spell. To him, casting fireball was as good as throwing firecrackers, in short, it's a completely useless spell. This was a normal reaction, so Link explained, my fireballs are not like ordinary ones. I've modified them with supreme magical skill. Is that so? Jacker was not impressed. He'd heard that spells could be improved by supreme magical skills, but even if he had the capability to modify and improve spells, a level point zero spell was still a level point zero spell. Could it ever rival a level point one spell? How about we go to the woods and test out my spell, so you can judge it yourselves? Link suggested. He was in dire need of some money, but if he faced Victor alone, the possibility of defeat was high. But with the help of these three mercenaries, he might have a chance. He did not worry about the possibilities of getting betrayed by these three at all, and even if they tried to kill him off after the mission, he believed that he could easily defeat them all with his fireball. Even the level point three warrior was no match for him. The three mercenaries looked at each other, then nodded. If the young magician's skills turned out to be useful, then they would gain another comrade, and that wouldn't be so bad after all. So the three found a clearing in the woods, then Jacker raised his thick iron shield in front of him and told Link, aim your fireballs at my shield, then I'll judge how powerful you are myself. Link nodded, but he did not hurry to attack. My fireball can travel around your shield though, so you might not be able to block it, he said with a smile. Never mind that, just attack me with all your might. Jacker's face turned serious, his shield began to glow in a light of combat aura. It was an earthly yellow shade, meaning that his combat aura was of the earth element, it was excellent for defense. In truth, Jacker didn't think much of Link's warning. It would only be a level point zero spell after all. Once, in the north, Jacker had fought against an opponent who purchased a fireball magic scroll. When he launched the fireball at Jacker's body, the only damage it did was leave a scorching mark on his leather armor. Seeing that Jacker was fully prepared, Link said, I'll start now then. Go on, Jacker nodded. Gildern who was standing aside was getting impatient, hurry up, kid. It's just fireball, so stop dawdling. Just do it already and let me hear a nice boom. Before he finished the sentence, Link had made his move. In an instant, the smile on Link's face disappeared and his eyes turned solemn. His whole body projected an air of seriousness and apathy, this was his calm and concentrated state of spellcasting. Link waved his wand gently in the air, and then a dimly glowing light blue marble appeared, not just one, but two, then three blue marbles appeared at the same time. The three glass orbs left three zigzagging trails in the air that seemed to move randomly, and they all aimed for Jacker at the same time from different directions. One glass orb hit the shield, another went for Jacker's sides near his ear, and the last one aimed at Jacker's lower body. The fireball's speed was hypersonic. In an instant, Jacker's pupils shrank to a pinprick, and he was overwhelmed by an ominous feeling. This was nothing like magic scrolls. 
Is this what it was like when a true magician casts spells? How was it possible for the spellcasting speed to be this quick? And why did they look nothing like normal fireballs at all? How could this spell be so nimble and agile? What he saw in front of him was beyond Jacker's expectation. For the first time, he felt he was in grave danger. This was definitely not like those firecrackers that he had seen, these fireballs were out for his life. Could it be that this is the true power of supreme magical skill? Jacker's mind was trying to guess amidst the chaos. He realized that his knowledge of magic spells had been so limited. He saw those aberrant fireballs closing in on him so he gave out a loud roar then raised his shield with one hand to block the fireball and used the other hand that emanated combat aura to deflect the other fireball that was rushing towards his ear. As for the fireball that was heading for his lower body, he could only close his legs together and hope that it wouldn't do too much damage. Bang! The shield was the first to be hit by the fireball. Even though the shield completely blocked the explosion, the brunt of the impact still numbed Jacker's arm. This is bad. Jacker began to panic. The fireball that hit his shield was of no more danger to him, but from the power of the explosion he knew that had his body been any nearer to it, it would have done some serious damage. He wasn't sure if his hands could cope with the other incoming fireball. He braced for the looming impact, but the fireball exploded just a foot away from his body. Bang! Bang! Two successive explosions boomed, and Jacker felt a gust of hot air hitting his body. He knew Link had eased the power of the attack, and that he was now safe. He heaved a sigh of relief. Thank you. Jacker felt a new respect for Link. This young magician really was something. Yes, his fireball was terrifying, and its power was immense, but it wasn't the power that was remarkable. What really was frightening was the magician's dexterity in spellcasting. While it really was just a level point zero spell, in the hands of this young man, the spell came to life. It was like being hit with a torrent of spells, making it close to unstoppable. In that moment of confrontation, Jacker could smell the scent of his own death. Gildern and Lucy didn't comprehend what had truly happened, so they asked, Jacker, how was it? How good was he? Jacker did not reply, he looked at Link and said, let them try it. These two wouldn't know real power if it hit them in their face. Link didn't object, of course. In his plans to go against Victor, he would have to lead, and the three mercenaries would be his helping hands. In that position, he would naturally need to display the extent of his power to inspire their respects. Link waved the new moon wand twice in the air, and two glass orbs shot towards Gildern and Lucy. The speed of the fireball that he released was quick, so quick that Gildern didn't have enough time to knock his arrows. Bang! A glass orb exploded not far from Gildern's ear, and the impact of the explosion hit him squarely. Before this loudmouthed archer had the time to utter a word, he fainted instantly. Link controlled the intensity of the energy in that fireball so as to not seriously hurt him. Ah! Lucy was shocked, immediately she drew her sword, as soon as the blade reflected the orb's light she cut through the glass orb. Link did not control his spell to evade her attacks, he only allowed Lucy's sword to cut the glass orb. Lucy was only a level point two swordswoman, it was enough to let her feel the power of his spell, there was no need to hurt her. Bang! The fireball exploded right at the edge of Lucy's sword, and it absorbed the impact of the fireball's explosion. The power of glass orb was comparable to that of level point one fireballs, and the impact of level point one fireballs was comparable to that of a grenade. So the impact from the explosion of Link's glass orbs was equivalent to that of a grenade as well. This kind of power was naturally something the lithe and agile professional swordswoman Lucy couldn't stand. Ah! Lucy cried out in terror. It felt as if her sword was hit by an electric shock, it vibrated violently till her wrist felt numb, and she knew she couldn't fight anymore. Even though she still held her sword in her hand, she knew she didn't have the energy to fight further. Another fireball attack and she would end up on the ground just like Gildern. 
I lost, Lucy relented. She didn't wonder why Jacker had that kind of expression just now. This magician's fireball was truly a force to be reckoned with. How's Gildern? Jacker looked at the archer who'd fainted. He's fine. But he can be too chatty sometimes, Link laughed. Jacker and Lucy stared at each other, they now understood that the young man in front of them was nothing like what he seemed. Despite his gaunt and frail figure, his spellcasting skill was something the three of them couldn't match up even if they combined their forces. He's a diamond in the rough. Jacker and Lucy made eye contact, and both sensed from each other's eyes that the other had the same thought. Now, let's talk strategies, Link smiled, his arms waving gently, and the wand danced deftly in his hand. Chapter 38 Let's Charge In You are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.B.O. Studio The Flamingo Band of Mercenaries had given in to Link, and once the Archer Gildern came to, they would be on the move at once. Jacker had previously done some investigating for the mission, and their destination was the north.western part of the Gervinth Forest called the Cove of Echoes. As they journeyed, Jacker briefed Link on the situation they'd be facing from the intel he gathered. Dark Brotherhood members will be guarding the cove entrance, patrolling the surrounding hundred yards. There's a cave in there, which, according to the information we gathered, is Victor's usual hideout spot. Several bodyguards surround him inside the cave, each of them an elite member of the Brotherhood, highly skilled in combat. Do you guys know how many people we'll be facing? Link asked. There should be at least 60 patrolling the cove. I'm not certain about the bodyguards inside the cave, but there shouldn't be less than 30 of them, Jacker explained, we're only four people, so storming straight into the lion's den might be a bad idea. Our original plan was to keep watch at the cove mouth. Victor is the leader of the Dark Brotherhood, people like that can't just hide in a cave forever. He must come out eventually, and when that happens, we'll ambush and kill him. Except we've been lying in wait for a fortnight and we haven't seen his shadow once. Gildern's hands were held out, his face a picture of dejection. Link felt he was still left in the dark about some key things, so he asked the most eloquent one out of the three, Lucy, what exactly is the story here? So Lucy explained every detail from the beginning to the end, and now things started to make sense to Link. As it turned out, the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries had originated from the north, but ever since the Dark Elves attacked the city of Gladstone, Jacker, who was the leader, felt it wouldn't be safe to stay there. There was a very high possibility that they would encounter the Dark Elf army, and those bloodthirsty creatures had never shown any sympathy towards humans before. They'd kill you the moment they saw you, no questions asked. As things stood, they'd be sticking their necks out tempting fate if they stayed there, so they moved south. Just twenty days prior, the three reached Gervinth Forest. They then later received a mission from the River Cove Town Hall. Afterwards, they nosed around for a bit and gathered roughly enough information and decided to keep watch at the Cove of Echoes. But in the end, the ambush was a fruitless effort. For two weeks, they hadn't seen a single trace of Victor. Link tapped his forehead lightly with the tip of his wand. He thought deeply for a while, and not long after he came out with an idea. It's impossible for Victor to hide in the cave all the time. Since you've never seen him come out, it's possible that he's not inside the cave in the first place. Either that, or there's another passage out of the cave, that impossible. He's definitely in there, that's his old lair. All of the Brotherhood members we've caught said so, Jacker cried. That leaves the second option, then, Link tugged at his hands, I have heard that cunning rabbits would dig many exits from its burrow. Victor himself is a death.Fearing cunning man, I'm sure he would never trap himself in the middle of the cove. If my guess isn't wrong, the other exit must be inside the cave. As a matter of fact, in the game, there was a cave in the Cove of Echoes which was a duplicate, called the Silent Mine. The passages in the cave were a complex mix of many dead ends, like a maze. There were at least three different exits. Many players who entered the duplicate for the first time would get lost, 
wandering in there for half a day and they would still find no trace of Victor. And precisely because of that, the duplicate was commonly called the Silent Maze. Now that this is a real world, the condition of the cave could only be worse. What Link said made a lot of sense to the mercenaries, and they were all convinced. Lucy knitted her brows and said, then the secret exit must be Victor's most important safeguard, only the most important members of the Brotherhood would know about it. There's no way we could ever find it. That damn turtle, that cowardly mouse. Gildern shook the arrows in his hands with fury. He thought of the wasted fortnight when they were waiting at the cove mouth like idiots, braving rain and cold for nothing, and that enraged him even more. Jacker turned to Link. Do you have any ideas? Jacker had gradually come to respect Link, firstly because of his power, and secondly because of his brains. Link had long had an answer in mind, laughingly he said, let's charge in. As he finished his words, the three mercenaries stood gaping. Jacker furrowed his brows. Gildern's face wore a baffled expression, if he hadn't learned his lessons earlier, he would have shot out a barrage of insults. But Lucy had a wry smile on her face. Link, there are only four of us, they outnumber us thirty times over. Link merely laughed at this and didn't reply. He was thinking of ways to spend his Omni points. He currently had 105 Omni points. According to the rules of Omni Point Exchange, one Omni Point could be traded for 10 maximum mana points, but now that his magic was in a weakened state, the effect would be cut down by 90%. One Omni Point exchanging with one maximum mana point might seem small, but he did have a decent amount of Omni Points after all. After thinking about it, Link decided to exchange 75 Omni Points with maximum mana points, so now his maximum mana limit was 99.1. He also brought along with him a bottle of low-dot-level mana potion that could quickly increase his mana by 100 points. With one bottle, he could fully replenish his mana, which meant that he had 198 expendable mana points today. One of his glass bead spells would use up one mana point. As a result, he could cast 198 glass beads, plus he had three helpers, and one glass bead per one of the ruffians wasn't a problem. He could also complement his attacks with other spells and combat tactics so storming into the cave was, in fact, not an impossible task. But Link didn't increase his maximum mana limit for this reason alone, he simply had no choice but to do it. When he thought about it, one single level point four spell like Flame Blast would cost him 320 mana points. In his current condition, he couldn't even cast one Flame Blast, but after adding 75 points, and once the ailing mana effect had subsided, he would have 991 mana points. Not to mention, his Omni points would have increased substantially by then too, so he would be able to purchase level point 4 or even level point 5 spells. What's more, he would be able to use them immediately instead of having to wait because his maximum mana was too low. Even if his Omni points were not sufficient, he would still have one flame blast spell left. It also wasn't such a bad idea to leave some Omni points on standby. There still were considerable risks involved in the storming of the Cove of Echoes. If his mana ran out then he'd be in deep trouble, and if his Omni points were depleted then he'd surely be finished. So he decided to reserve the 30 Omni points he had left for emergencies. The whole process of increasing mana points took place in Link's head. Just like that the whole process was all done. Then he smiled and said, if it was just the three of you then it would certainly be a suicide mission, but with me, it's absolutely no problem. Dot. Jacker and the other two stared speechlessly at each other. Those words did hurt their egos, but as they thought of the power that Link had demonstrated earlier they simply couldn't argue with him. They had only seen this young magician use a fireball spell, but who's to say he didn't have more tricks up his sleeve. But still, this was just too outlandish. The three still looked unconvinced, so Link waved his wand back and forth and said, it's getting dark, we must decide now. I've got just one life myself, I wouldn't send us all to certain death, would I? That did make a lot of sense. Jacker believed that such a powerful young magician would not toy with him. 
What exactly do we have to do, then, he asked. Link had a plan in his mind. First, he purchased a spell, Physical Avatar. Physical Avatar Level Point 1 Earth Element Spell Effect Creates a Shadow Avatar The Avatar can produce sounds of footsteps, can speak and emanate scents. It is indistinguishable from an ordinary person. Note It cannot swim. Do not let it be exposed to rain if you don't want your cover blown. This trick wouldn't fool a magician, but it could easily dupe every single one of those dim dot witted goons in the Dark Brotherhood. Once the spell was ready, Link started to plan their combat tactics as he walked. The mercenaries listened keenly, their eyes twinkling in anticipation. When Link finally cast the physical avatar, producing a perfect double of Jacker, the three mercenaries had not a single thread of doubt left about the young magician's plans. Just as Link and the rest were preparing to storm the Cove of Echoes, in the silent mine, Victor was meeting a special guest. The guest was wearing a hooded cloak and his hands were gloved, no part of his skin was exposed. The only thing that gave some information about the guest was the blue gemstone wand in his hand. On the table in front of the two was a pouch and a crystal that emanated a blackish, purple light. Because of the crystal, the cave seemed shrouded in a mysterious darkness even though it was lit with many candles. Victor, this pouch contains precious gemstones worth more than 500 gold coins. That's your reward. What you need to do is to find a way to bring this crystal to a magician in the East Cove Magic Academy, any magician who has expressed interest in black magic. Yes, my lord. Victor's hand clutched the pouch tightly, his eyes filled with greed. All his life, the only thing he cared for was money. Once he received his money, he would hide the coins in a secret spot. Each time he kept his money away, his heart would be filled with a rush of satisfaction. Truth be told, he would have no problem selling off his own kin if the price was high enough. Don't let me down, and don't let master down. The black dot robed person's voice was hoarse. Had Link been there, he would have noticed that the mysterious individual had used magic to mask his real voice. I will do everything I can. Victor half dot knelt on the floor to demonstrate his solemnity. As he raised his head up, the black dot robed man was gone, just as suddenly as he had come. Victor was left in awe and respect. What a frightening skill. He grabbed the pouch on the table and opened it. Under the candle lights, the gemstones in the pouch shone blindingly bright. TSK TSK, a cat's eye stone, blue gemstone, fire diamond. What beauties! 500 gold coins for a mission, my lord sure is generous, Victor admired as he looked over each gemstone with detail. He was glad indeed. Chapter 39 Victor, I'm your father. You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator. Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor. Nyo I.B.O. Studio There were vast distinctions between the maps of the real world and the maps of the gaming world. Even though all landmarks were mainly in the same position, there were huge aberrations in the minute details between the two. All Link knew was that the Cove of Echoes was at the western part of the Gervant Forest. But how you actually get there, Link had absolutely no idea. In the game, there didn't seem to be such lush vegetation. Thickets grew taller than people, thorny shrubs were rampant. Coming from the modern world, walking into the forest was no different from walking into a treacherous maze. Luckily, Jacker and the rest were experienced mercenaries. They took on the role of living and walking maps. On the road, it was always Jacker who was leading the way in front, with Lucy behind him, then Link, and then lastly the archer, Gildern. This was Link's own arrangement, and he had reasons for it. He had just met this band of mercenaries. Although they did seem to be decent people, Link he knew nothing is more unfathomable than a human heart, so he thought it wise to be cautious, just in case. Jacker and Lucy were both more introverted, so they were harder for Link to size up. Gildern, on the other hand, was different. He had always been frank and forthright, so Link knew that though he may be brash sometimes, 
Gildern ultimately had no sinister intentions. Gildern was the only one Link trusted to let walk behind him. But while he was suspicious of the mercenaries, Link was unaware that the mercenaries themselves had nagging doubts about Link too. This magician was clearly powerful, and so mysterious too, they were naturally apprehensive about him. They didn't know if Link would betray them, trap them or kill them off after everything was over. It was as if all of them were pulled taut by a tense string in their hearts. And so, that was how the journey commenced, with a tense atmosphere where each side was wary of the other until they reached about 200 yards near the Cove of Echoes. There was a giant Sincona tree that was almost 200 feet tall. Its trunk was big enough for three people to hug it without their hands touching. It had a very dense canopy, so the four of them climbed up, hid within its foliage, and spied down into the cove from there. The cove entry was blocked by a huge natural boulder. Thick vines crawled all over the boulder, and dense shrubs grew at the base of the large rock. It was simply impossible to peer through and discern the exact position of the opening of the cove. Gildern pointed out to Link, the entry was right under the boulder, you see, it's right underneath the thickest vines there. Yes, right there, can you see it? Link squinted to focus his sights. Finally, he could make out a faint outline of a dark cave behind those thick and dense vines. Now that's a hidden spot, Link couldn't resist exclaiming. Then he asked Jacker, there's no way you could see what's going on in there from out here, how did you figure out the number of people inside? Jacker explained, after a certain interval of time, someone would bring fresh fruits and spices into the cove. Fruits are unreliable because they're too perishable, but for spices like garlic, onion, peppers and the like, their consumption rates were more stable. Taking into account the tastes of people around the Gervant Forest, from the rate of spice consumption, we thought there must be about 100 to 150 people. Then we supported this information with other observations, and we could pretty accurately estimate the total number of people inside. Link listened then nodded and said, that makes sense. He scrutinized the cove entrance, then asked again, are any of their hiding spots around here? Jacker shook his head, these bandits are confident no one would find their lair, so they don't have any ambush spots outside the cove. The cove entrance is a different matter, though. Lucy told me she sensed a strange aura around the cove entrance, as if. As if there was some kind of detection spell there. Link was surprised, he turned to Lucy and asked, this strange aura, you can sense it. Some people were born with an innate ability to sense the aura of mana. This was not that uncommon, in fact, it was one of the natural magic talents. In other words, Lucy would have a great potential if she were to become a magician. But of course, Lucy was only a commoner, she was born gifted, but had no money, and no one to guide her or tell her that she had a special gift. She ended up as just another average mercenary who happened to be sensitive to the presence of magic spells. To claim herself to be perceptive to magic spells in front of a true magician was something Lucy was wary of doing, but still, she nodded in agreement, I can sense it somehow, but I'm not certain about it. Gildern added, she's been really accurate, we couldn't count how many times our lives were saved because of her sense. Lucy gave him a quick stare, and her face began to redden, she felt even more embarrassed now. Link was not so surprised. Since Lucy thought there was a detection spell at the cove entry, then he'd better check it out. He considered it for a while, then decided to spend one mana point to purchase a level point zero spell. Basic detection spell level point zero spell effects. Roughly detects the auras in the surrounding area, including auras from mana, elements, secret forces, and so on. After the purchase was made, Link began to cast the spell at once. There was no need for the wand to cast this spell. He blinked his eyes twice then mana streamed into his pupils. A dim white light emanated from his eyes. At the same time, there was a slight change in his field of vision. Everything in his sight glowed in a veil of light, the ground was yellow, the trees were green, the rock was sprinkled with the bright white aura of metal elements, and at the cove entry, Link could see that it was shrouded with a barely discernible layer of crystal clear aura. The aura was hardly detectable, 
it was blocking the entrance to the cave, its light was transparent like the water in a stream, pure and clear, but its edges were distinct, it was indeed an aura full of mana. It was just as Lucy suspected, the cove entry was set up with a detection spell. When the basic detection spell wore out, Link turned to the three mercenaries, and saw three pairs of eyes, full of respect, looking back at him. Then he realized, a person whose eyes were glowing with light must look very mysterious, and this air of mystery would naturally have inspired awe and respect. At that moment, the three mercenaries had completely forgotten about Link's awkward looks when they first met him. They had now completely acknowledged him as an authentic magician. What did you see? asked Lucy. Link nodded, your perception of magic is indeed strong, they really did set up a spell at the cove opening. Gildern immediately laughed and said, didn't I tell you? Lucy's sense is always right. Lucy looked glad, and a little proud too. She had absolutely zero experience or knowledge of magic, but now that someone who truly was a magician finally acknowledged her abilities, she couldn't help but feel validated. If the news of her ability spread, it could be a great advantage for her to stand out among the mercenaries. From now on, she could tell people she can sense the presence of magic spells, and that a magician had acknowledged her gift. She was sure the other mercenaries would not look down on her again. Victor was indeed cautious. There was nothing more to observe outside the cove, so Link told the three mercenaries it was time climb down the tree. Once he reached the ground, Link immediately began to cast a spell on Jacker. He pointed his wand at Jacker, then a water dot-like aura shrouded Jacker's body, it moved from his head to his toes then back up three times. Link then waved his wand to the ground beside Jacker and the aura seeped into the ground. On the ground, the dirt started to move as if it was alive, then after a while, there was a mound protruding from the ground. First, it formed a dirt column, then arms grew out of it, then legs, then a head, and at last the five sensory organs of the face. Each part of the body gradually became more distinct, and when the spell was completed, an avatar that looked exactly like Jacker was formed. This physical avatar had everything that Jacker had, including his war hammer and shield. If the real Jacker and the avatar stood motionless side by side, there would be no way to tell one from the other. How wonderful! The three mercenaries couldn't tear their eyes from it. This was nothing close to what they'd ever seen before. Link pointed his wand at the cove entrance, and ordered, go, march into the cove in a defensive stance. The newly created Jacker then turned around, raised his shield in front of his body, then, with an expressionless face and without any fear or apprehension, marched into the cove. At the same time, Link told Jacker and the rest, let's go, We'll wait at the cove entry, and once the avatar attracts the attention of the bandits, we'll make our move. This was their careful plan, and in this plan, each of them had distinct responsibilities. Link was the sharpest spear in the team, so he was responsible for killing the opponents. Jacker and Lucy would stand guard beside Link, their job was to prevent him from getting shot by stray arrows. As for the archer Gildern, he would lend an extra hand in the killing. Link saw the fake Jacker reach the boulder, then the avatar nonchalantly strode into the cove. Link waved a hand and said, let's go, we'll follow him. The three mercenaries then surrounded Link, and together they stormed into the cove. On the way there, Link waved his wand at each of the mercenaries. Instantly, a layer of clear aura covered the three's bodies. Level point one spell. Cat's agility. Effect. It enhances the spell receiver's nimbleness and speed. Spell lasts for about 20 minutes. This was the first time the three mercenaries directly experienced the power of magical boosts. Their faces were full of amazement. Jacker kept waving the shield around, it felt as light as a leaf in his hand. Lucy took long sprightly strides, she felt as if she were flying. Gildern cried out in wonder, is this what magic feels like? What a wonderful thing. I feel. I feel as if I could sprint as fast as a warhorse. They're like three bumpkins. Link silently mocked. 
he then divided some of his attention to controlling the avatar currently storming into the cove. He was the one to cast the spell, so he could see in the perspective of the avatar, and also control the avatar's movement from afar. The physical avatar did not even try to cover his tracks or be covert, he was like a Spartan warrior, fearlessly storming into the enemy's den while letting out a thundering roar. Victor, you little coward. Come out and fight me in a duel to the death. Victor, you son of a b asterisk tch. Come on out. Victor, come meet your maker. The avatar's voice was booming, it didn't just travel across the cove, even those at the cove entry could hear him clearly. And there was a reason it was called the Cove of Echoes. All sounds echoed in the cove, again and again, lasting more than a few seconds. Victor, come meet your maker. 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 At the cove entry, the three mercenaries stared among themselves. If Victor could still hide in his cave after these insults, then he's no leader of the bandits, but a saint. When those bandits heard their leader mocked and insulted so disgracefully, they would definitely boil over and go berserk. When are those bastards coming out? Lucy kept licking her red lips, she was all too ready to kill. Jacker held the shield fast in one hand, and the other hand wielded the war hammer. Yes, come out, all of you, he said jeeringly, when this mission is over, I'll boast about how only the four of us managed to defeat the whole of the Dark Brotherhood. If all goes well today, I can live comfortably for the rest of my life. At that moment, the cove erupted into chaos, just like a kicked hornet's nest. Chapter 40 Give it all in one fell swoop you are listening at novel full dot audio. Translator Nyo I. Bo Studio Editor Nyo I. Bo Studio A Bizarre Madman, A Ridiculous Imbecile, Riding a Horse Alone Into the Cove Then Beginning to Insult and Ridicule Their Leader, Who Could Stand for That? Kill Him! Kill Him! Shoot Him With the Arrows! Turn Him Into a Porcupine! Skin Him Alive! Teach him a lesson that he'll remember into his next life. The expanse of the cove was large, and the trees were all cut down. The cove's land was oval-shaped, and the perimeter was lined with rows of wooden huts, about twenty or thirty of them, it seemed like a small village. In the middle of the cove was a clearing, and right in the middle of the clearing was a cave. Jacker's shadow avatar stormed into the clearing and stood there as he banged the metal shield with the war hammer in his hand. Victor, get out of that cave. If you've got the balls get out here and let's have a duel, he yelled. The avatar continued to spew out more insults, enraging the robbers even more. Dark Brotherhood members slowly continued to trickle out from the wooden huts around the clearing. They only stood there surrounding the avatar, not one of them making a move. These bandits were all carrying impressive weapons. The ones nearest to the avatar held single dot handed swords and a shield. From the shine, they must have been made from steel. They also wore good quality black leather armor and protective metal plates which had both aesthetic and practical value. The bandits furthest from the avatar wore the same leather armor, but they were holding longbows in their hands, and their arrows were all aiming towards the intruder. There were about seventy or so robbers there, but none of them hurried to make a move. One with double swords in his hands walked out from the crowd. He sneered at the avatar and said, Our leader won't stoop to accept anyone's challenge. If you want to fight him, then you have beat us first. The bandit was wearing leather armor of a higher quality than those around him, he also wore a helmet. He must have been a lesser chief amongst the bandits in the cove. The avatar made no answer, instead, he only positioned himself into a defensive stance. Ha! You really are an idiot after all. The lesser chief went back into the crowd. There were seventy-five of them all around the intruder, their arrows knocked and ready. Even if the intruder was a level point six warrior clad in full dot body iron armor, he would still come to a sorry end when all the archers shot their arrows down at him. Just as the bandit's attention was focused on the avatar, Gildern asked in a low voice, attack now. Link shook his head, no, wait for the moment the avatar makes a move. 
Gildern, your target is the small chief. Kill him with one arrow. Just after the first wave of attacks came to pass, there would be a break before the next attack. This gap was the safest window of time for them to retaliate. If they attacked now, the risk of being hit by a stray arrow would be too high. The three mercenaries had plenty of combat experience, their only reply was a gentle nod of the head. Link breathed in and his whole spirit was calmed. His gentle demeanor was gone without a trace, and now he only looked solemn and still. In that instant, he focused all his energy and entered a state of absolute tranquility in preparation for spellcasting. In that moment, everything in Link's surroundings melded together like the flow of water. Every emotion in him was gone, and all he could see and think of now was the target in front of him. The flow of time seemed to slow down, the preparation for the spell was done. His eyes focused solely on the ring of bandits. The shadow avatar in the middle of their enemies immediately lowered its head and made a move as if to charge. Kill him. The chief bandit ordered. The strum of bowstrings rang out, and at least forty arrows were shot towards the avatar, his whole body quickly covered with the wooden bolts. But the avatar did not fall. The magic structure inside his body remained undamaged, and he kept on propelling forward. The bandits all stood in shock, none of them fully understanding what they were seeing. A moment later, one of them suddenly noticed the slumped body of their chief. An arrow was shot through one of his eyes and pierced right through his brain. He was dead. The bandits grew even more alarmed. Did someone misaim and shoot the chief instead? But they were shooting at such a small distance, how could anyone make such a stupid mistake? The bandit thought to himself. Then, suddenly, rapid successions of explosions resounded throughout the cove. Bang! 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 After each explosion, an archer would fall. The faces of these archers were a horrifying mess of flesh and blood. Their noses, eyes, and lips were an indistinguishable muddle, they were completely destroyed. Such a frightening attack came from nowhere, and the bandits began to panic. Each of them suspiciously eyed left and right for the unseen perpetrator. After about two seconds, the most perceptive of them identified the attacker's location. The assailants were hiding behind a wooden hut, there were four of them. Behind a huge figure who looked very familiar, a quick series of fireballs flew out. There were close to twenty fireballs released within a single second, each one aiming at a different archer. In just two seconds, forty small balls of fire shot out and exploded on impact. Immediately afterward, all of the archers fell, their faces totally obliterated. It was clear by the looks of it that not one of them survived. After the Gladstone experience, Link was accustomed to sights of blood, murder, and death. He felt no mercy for these bandits either, they were just villains anyway. The archers were all dead and only the bandits with swords and shields were left standing. Now they had no means of long dot range attacks. What the hell just happened, one robber said out loud. The pupils of the mercenaries shrank in size at the horrifying sight before them, they were simply dumbfounded. In their eyes, they saw the tough archers drop one by one like flies, like rows of wheat cut down by the scythe of the god of death himself, each death insignificant and meaningless. Was this how magic really was? Was this how powerful magicians truly were? Even though Link had explained that if he was given two seconds to cast his spells he could eliminate all of their strongest enemies, they still weren't prepared for the gruesome sight. It left a huge impact on the three mercenaries. It was just dreadful. Go. Charge forward. Link whispered urgently. In his head he was thinking about how tedious low.level spells were. With higher level spells, such as a level 0.4 lightning storm or a level 0.4 flame blast, facing that many opponents wouldn't be an issue. Jacker charged forward without thinking, Lucy and Gildern followed him. Like the bandits, they were scared out of their minds. The bandits quickly came to their senses, however. It's a magician. Take cover, someone amongst the robbers shouted. 
But just as he finished his words, a dim glass orb shot through and hit the bandit's face, leaving a beautiful but deadly trail of light. Bang! The crash was so loud that it could topple over a large tree. Just like that the bandit's face was blown clean off. Without a sound, the bandit fell to the ground. The other robbers were so shocked they were stunned motionless. They covered their faces with their shields and cowered themselves away from Link in terror. Some of them ran towards the huts, some towards caves in deeper parts of the cove, all to escape the terrifying attack. The events went just as Link had expected. He had chosen to use the spells to scare the bandits and make them panic. In two seconds, he cast forty glass orbs, each one hitting its target accurately. Link felt tired from his mental exertion, his head started to ache, so he had to decrease his spellcasting speed. But even so, in one second he still managed to cast seven to ten fireballs. To ensure that his mental fortitude wasn't damaged any further, these fireballs were only aimed to hit the body of the bandits, rather than using more energy to focus on headshots. Even if it didn't kill them, that was okay because the orbs could deal some serious damage, enough so to render them motionless. Gildern would then shoot an arrow at them, finishing off the already injured bandit. The panicked robbers did not retaliate much, instead, they were too busy frantically hiding and attempting to escape. But no matter how fast they were, their feet couldn't match the speed of Link's spells. Having already lost 40 of their archers, there were just 35 of them left. Five seconds later, the last bandit running towards the cave fell as the back of his neck was hit by Link's glass bead, and his head was blown off his shoulders. The cove quickly returned to its normal calmness. A gentle breeze flowing through the air bringing with it the heavy stench of blood. The whole cove had become a mass grave. Jacker gulped nervously, and Lucy was silent and deep in thought. Just what kind of creature have we gotten ourselves mixed up with here? Gildern muttered under his breath. They had been mercenaries for many years, so it's not that they'd never seen a magician cast spells before. In fact, they had worked with a wandering magician's apprentice once. They'd relied on him to open locked doors, but that magician needed at least three seconds to cast a simple spell like candlelight. At that time, the Flamingo band of mercenaries thought that this was how all magicians worked. But now, their initial impressions had been turned upside down. Link's skills in magic were so powerful that in the moment it took to utter the words of the spell a life was instantaneously destroyed. It was unnervingly fast, it churned their stomachs in fear. Could I ever survive being hit by such an attack? The three mercenaries asked themselves. They were sure they couldn't, not even if they were prepared for it. As he saw the three standing idly at the mouth of the cave, Link furrowed his brows and said sharply, What are you waiting for? Get inside the cave before Victor escapes. Eh. Ah, right. Jacker quickly snapped out of it and was the first to storm into the cave. Link followed him, and then Lucy and Gildern. Link had sensed their fear of his magic, so in a low voice, Link said, I'm a bit tired right now, I need to rest for a few minutes. I'll leave the rest up to you all. Showing your weakness at the right time can calm others. As expected, the three mercenaries noticeably relaxed as soon as Link said that. Their clumsy movements had become sharper. He's just a normal person, after all, the three simultaneously thought. Nonetheless, this did not make them respect him any less, in fact, they respected him even more now. Not only did he eliminate the biggest threats of the mission at the cave entrance, he had also geared them up with magic buffs. If they still couldn't deal with the bandits in the cave, then they'd better not call themselves the Flamingo Band of Mercenaries anymore. They weren't too shabby themselves after all. Just as the Shadow Avatar stormed into the cove, the crystal in Victor's room glowed with a dim red light. The magic crystal that Victor had spent a fortune on had worked just as expected. Red light, that meant intruders. The light was very dim, signifying that the number of intruders was small, probably less than ten. Some mercenaries too greedy for money to fear for their lives, probably, Victor thought amusedly. 
Victor didn't bother to move from his chair, he just sat there and continued to sort out his papers. As the leader of a big brotherhood, he was too busy to deal with trivial matters like that. He would just have to leave the intruders to his underlings. He was sure they would bring the attackers to him in a moment. Whether they brought in a living body or a corpse, it didn't matter to him.